A passenger plane is obliterated in the California hills. There were no wings, no fuselage. There was no tail section. There were no aircraft seats. Hardened steel is ripped to pieces. This was the worst damage I've ever seen. The wreckage paints a grim picture of the final moments of Pacific Southwest Airlines Flight 1771. The plane reached impossibly high speeds. They tell us that it actually broke the sound barrier. Passengers experienced crippling G-forces. We assessed the, the impact forces around 5,000 Gs. It would have been a horrifying experience, the final few seconds of their lives. Whatever brought down Flight 1771, investigators are certain of one thing. It was not an accident. Los Angeles International Airport, one of the busiest in the world. Every year, 40 million passengers arrive and depart through LAX. At Terminal 1, a group of passengers and crew bound for San Francisco are making their way through security. A short while later, they board Pacific Southwest Airlines Flight 1771. Pacific Southwest really was a, what we'd call a large regional airline at the time. Maybe you sent me up with a scotch on your way back? They had service in about 30 cities all over, mostly the western part of the United States. The flight from Los Angeles to San Francisco was one of the most popular routes at Pacific Southwest also known as PSA. Among the 38 passengers are several PSA employees, including the airline's chief pilot. It's very common for airline employees to commute between cities for work, and so as people would take a bus to work, many airline employees take a plane to work. Captain Greg Lindemood has been flying with PSA for 14 years. The father of three is also a decorated combat veteran. Brakes. Brakes up. Flaps up. Spoilers retract. First officer, James Nunn, only joined the airline the previous spring. He's also logged thousands of hours in the cockpit. Trust leaders. Today they're piloting a British-built BAE-146 commuter jet. With quiet turbofan engines, it's designed for short-haul flights over densely populated areas. The flight to San Francisco will take just over an hour. So do you know what you're getting, boys, for Christmas? Well, it's going to be Nintendo. And with what it costs, I think they can go share it. <laughs> Anything to drink, guys? I'll have five minutes. Okay, just hold if you change your mind. Flight 1771 is cruising at 22,000 feet above the California countryside. Just over halfway through the flight, Captain Lindemood worries about the mild turbulence. Center, PSA-1771. Any reports on the ride ahead? We've had a little continuous light shot. PSA, this is Rocky Mountain Center. It's occupied. Oh my god, that was a gun. No, the no. crew now has a much bigger problem on its hands. Squawk 77, Squawk 77. We've had a gun fired on board the aircraft. You want to go Monterey? Moments later, flight 1771 falls into a steep dive. 
Witnesses caught a, a brief glimpse of the aircraft as it was plummeting down from the sky. It was going at a high rate of speed. It looked like a dart just diving to the ground. Flight 1771 crashes into an isolated hill 280 kilometers northwest of Los Angeles. Police get to the crash site and find a 30-ton airliner obliterated. There were no wings, there were no uh, fuselage, there was no, there was no tail section, there were no aircraft seats, there was just papers papers everywhere and uh, the strong smell of aviation fuel it doesn't take long for sheriff steve Baltz to reach a grim conclusion no one has survived the crash we're making a, a frantic search throughout this remote cow pasture looking for survivors and we can't even find deceased human beings much less human beings that have survived this is one of the worst air disasters in California history. Come on up there, guys. The day after the crash, investigators from both the National Transportation Safety Board and the FBI are on the scene. You ever seen anything like this? It's going to be a long day, guys. We knew that gunshots had been heard by the air traffic controllers. If the reports of gunshots were accurate, uh, then I realized immediately that we had crime aboard an aircraft for which the FBI had primary jurisdiction. But the reports may not be accurate. The pilots and controllers may have been mistaken. Even though speculation about the gunman's identity is widespread, it's up to the NTSB to determine exactly what happened on Flight 1771. One of the things you have to avoid in accident investigation is preconceived notions. Uh, for example, most of us never turn on the radio, never watch television on the way to the scene, because even though you might not consciously be aware of it, you can get front-loaded with information, and when you get there, you may subconsciously start looking for things to substantiate that background. So uh, you, you try to arrive on scene with a totally uh, objective view of what's going on. While NTSB investigators tried to determine the cause of the crash, law enforcement agents have questions of their own. It's establishing who had motive, establishing who had access, establishing who was the intended victim. Right there. There should be somewhere right in there. The FBI is searching for evidence of a crime. The NTSB for clues about the crash. If they can recover the black boxes, they may find both. With the total destruction of the aircraft, I mean, you had limited amounts of information that you could gather from the wreckage. At this point, the, the, the most important thing is to get the cockpit voice recorder and get away from the speculation and see what the cockpit voice recorder tells us factually. The flight recorders tell the tale of what happens to the aircraft. They're very important in reconstructing uh, the events that, are, that brought the airplane down. The impact comes in this way. Right from its tail. It should be somewhere in here. I think that's it. After hours of searching through the shattered remains, the effort finally pays off. They recover the plane's two black boxes. The first recorder that was recovered was the cockpit voice recorder, and that was recognized by its orange cover and all that that was still, although badly mangled, was still recognizable as a recorder. Mm -hmm. The second black box has suffered even heavier damage. The flight data recorder captures critical information about the aircraft's performance. What a mess. What a mess. It had been so badly mangled, it wasn't recognizable as a flight data recorder. Both recorders will be sent to the NTSB laboratory in Washington. It is far from certain whether the data they hold can be successfully retrieved. Without it, investigators may never know what happened on Flight 1771.
That's about the first thing you do when you get on the scene, find the cockpit voice recorder. You can't overemphasize how important that was in this case because we had no airframe left to work with. We really had no wreckage in the normal sense of the word. At the NTSB laboratory in Washington, Dennis Grossi examines Flight 1771's badly damaged cockpit voice recorder. The case itself was basically crushed. It was bent in like somebody grabbed it and pushed it together like that. Uh, and this is hardened steel, and we assess the, the impact forces around 5,000 Gs just based on the deformation of the uh, crash enclosure. The recorder, the aircraft, and everyone on board suffered an impact force 5,000 times the force of gravity. The world's best fighter pilots can handle a sustained force of 9 Gs. In a crash, the human body can sometimes survive 100 Gs for a split second. A force 50 times as strong is difficult to comprehend. Dennis Grossi knows the immense impact may have ruined any chance of hearing the last words from the cockpit of Flight 1771. No crash investigation is routine. But among the jigsaw puzzle of pieces from Flight 1771, investigators are looking for something very different, perhaps a gun. Finding the weapon could help the FBI identify who might have fired shots on board Flight 1771. But for the NTSB, gunfire alone does not explain this accident. A bullet should not bring down a modern commercial jet. There's a lot of misconception about decompression and about whether or not a for example, a single shot could bring down an aircraft, and if it's, if it's simply a shot through the fuselage of the aircraft, the answer would be no. It takes a much larger hole in the fuselage for there to be an explosive decompression. The kind of hole that led to one of the deadliest air disasters of all time. In 1974, a faulty cargo door blew off Turkish Airlines Flight 981. The decompression caused the cabin floor to collapse severing the flight control cables. The crash killed all 346 people on board. The aircraft would normally not come down just from a bullet hole with no other implications. Uh, it just wouldn't be enough to cause a, a, an explosive decompression, which is what you almost have to have to bring the aircraft down. If a gunshot didn't bring the plane down, then investigators need to find out what did. At the NTSB lab in Washington, work to recover Flight 1771's cockpit voice recording has produced a surprising result. Despite suffering huge impact forces, the audio tape is still intact. All right, let's give it a listen. The first 28 minutes of the tape reveal a routine flight. The crew was trying to find out when the turbulence they had been flying through would end. Can you ask him how it's been? Center, PSA 1771. Any reports on the right ahead? We've had a little continuous light shot. PSA, this is Rocky Center. It's Rocky Center. You hear the flight crew talk, you know, do their normal procedures. But in the final two minutes, events take a chilling turn. Sure sounds like a gunshot. And then all of a sudden, they hear, and we hear on the recording, this gunshot. The tape confirms what the pilots had reported. Two gunshots. Squad 77, Squad 77, we had a gun fired on board the aircraft. It was actually a, a very sobering moment because we realized that we were listening to two people communicating with each other, the pilot and co-pilot, uh, in a very routine flight that suddenly became anything but routine. Uh, it was something that uh, one doesn't quickly forget. Investigators listen as the situation becomes increasingly more disturbing. The door to the cockpit was heard open, and a female voice, presumably the flight attendant, was heard to say in a voice that was filled with alarm. There's a problem, Captain! And we heard a voice, a male voice, which we presume to be the captain, saying, what's the nature of the problem? What's the problem? I'm the problem. Investigators now know for certain that the killer was a man and that he shot the flight crew. It's always startling when you hear something like that, when you hear the commission of a murder. As accident investigators, you just don't hear that. This was a very unusual recording. 
A flight attendant and both pilots are shot. That's five shots so far. And uh, then we could hear the cockpit door shut again. And another final shot, the, the sixth shot. Before the tape ends, they hear one last ominous sound. The plane's in a dive. The engines are over revving. Within about five seconds, we picked up what's called windscreen noise. In other words, uh, you could tell that the aircraft was accelerating. That noise increased in its pitch. We learned, of course, that it was going into a dive at that point. 65 seconds after the murder of its crew, Flight 1771 smashes into the California hills. It helped us to understand why we were investigating the heinousness of the crime that we were investigating. The CDR recording changes the NTSB's role in the case. Let me know if I can help. It just confirms that uh, this wasn't an accident, that it was in fact a crime, and the FBI would be taking over the investigation from here on out. The FBI, bear in mind, knows how to investigate crime. They don't necessarily know how to investigate an aircraft accident. So we, we would go ahead and do our normal investigative procedures and make that information available to the FBI. The FBI is investigating a murder, but solving it is now just one of their priorities. The, I'm the, the CDR recording has highlighted another pressing issue. Somehow, someone managed to get a gun on that plane. A weapon was smuggled through LAX, one of the world's busiest airports. Investigators wonder how the shooter managed to evade airport security. Let's find out how that guy got on the plane, all right? If the FBI can't find answers soon, more lives could be at risk. Two days after the downing of Flight 1771, Investigators are still combing through the wreckage for a piece of evidence rarely found at a crash site. A murder weapon. That's a hydraulic line, probably from the main gear. The search for the gun was very frustrating because we knew that that played a major role in what had happened. We needed to know for sure uh, that the gun was there. I mean, it's a supposition, pretty good supposition that there is a gun involved. We weren't sure that, that we would succeed because the field of debris was so wide and the impact had reduced the airplane to so many small pieces. While the search for the gun continues in California, NTSB investigators in Washington try to determine what caused Flight 1771 to go into a sudden dive after the crew was shot. Dennis Grossi believes the answer may lie in the shattered remains of the FDR, the flight data recorder. The internal magazine that held the tape was the only part that was actually recovered. The rest was, was not recovered. Worse still, almost all the tape that records data is gone, torn from the machine when it slammed into the ground. This was the worst damage I've ever seen. Grossi examines a critical part of the recorder, the tape heads that lay down data onto the magnetic tape. He finds a tiny piece of recording tape has survived. The magazine didn't survive, and the tape itself was destroyed, except for about a six to eight inch piece of tape that ran around the recording heads and the capstan. With such a short piece of tape, it's doubtful there will be any useful information on it at all. We worked real hard at, at trying to get all the data that we could off of that little piece of tape. Meanwhile, investigators in California finally find what they've been hunting for, the barrel of a gun. The gun was found by one of the FBI agents uh, pretty much in the middle of, of where the uh, aircraft impacted. We were very, very fortunate when we found the gun. It was uh, an unbelievable stroke of luck. It's not just any gun. It's a 44 caliber Magnum. A 44 Magnum was considered the most powerful handgun that you can have. But the barrel alone isn't enough. They need the rest of the weapon. Fortunately, they find it. The cylinder with six spent cartridges. Uh, it was, its frame is very powerfully constructed, so for it to tear the barrel off just suggests the power of that crash impact. The shattered pistol leads to a morbid discovery. 
when we found what was left of the gun, there was a portion of the finger between the trigger and the trigger guard. Uh, that went back to the FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia. Lab analysis may help solve the mystery that hangs over the entire investigation. The FBI has a weapon, a crime scene, and 42 murder victims. What's missing is proof of the identity of the 43rd person on board, the killer. We, uh, in our investigation today here at the site, have located a weapon, and that weapon is going to be examined, and of course, any connection between it and the crime will be more fully developed. We needed to determine a motive for why someone would, would do such a thing. Somebody would have had to fire those gunshots, and there had to be a reason for it. It's part of the seat, part of the frame. Really, as far as the investigation on scene, it's it's totally NTSB as far as the kick in the tin, if you will. Uh, but we were able to answer questions that might arise from the FBI investigators on the scene. As I say, they don't have the expertise to know what to look for, but from the criminal aspects of it, they certainly know what to ask about. Part of a frame. At the crash site, the NTSB has recovered a piece of wreckage that could help explain what happened on flight 1771, a fragment of a passenger seat. We actually found a seat that had a bullet hole in it. If they can determine exactly where the seat was located, then PSA's passenger seating records could give investigators the name of another one of the victims shot before the plane went down. Dennis Grossi has done all he can to salvage data from the small fragment of tape recovered from the flight data recorder. I was able to decode that little strip of tape, and I got the last seconds. It does contain data, but only six seconds worth. Investigators learned that in its final moments, the aircraft was operating normally, with no mechanical problems, except for one thing. Someone had pushed the control column forward forcing the plane into a steep dive. The aircraft accelerated to the speed of sound. We aimed from 22,000 feet with cruise power on all four engines. Investigators now understand why only very small pieces of wreckage were found at the crash site. When the aircraft hit at such a high speed, it impacted and basically compressed the earth and then and then they released and it blew everything back out of the hole. The heavy impact propelled some debris straight back into the air before it could be singed by the explosion. All the light material, all of the, the paper on the aircraft, any, uh, any of the insulation material on the aircraft, all that light stuff got blown up into the air and then the wind carried it for, I believe, miles. The fact that the plane was forced into a dive explains why PSA 1771 crashed so quickly. It also adds even greater urgency to the FBI investigation. Since it was almost certainly the killer's hand on the controls, this is now the worst mass murder in California history. But investigators still don't have enough evidence to be certain who the killer was, nor who he was trying to kill. Was it the work of a madman? who wanted to commit mass murder? Or did the killer target one particular passenger and coldly sacrifice everyone else on board? The FBI investigation into the onboard shooting and fatal crash of PSA Flight 1771 has uncovered a lapse in security at LAX. It may explain how a gun was smuggled onto the aircraft. Any number of people in the airport could bypass the security screening that was going on. Agent Bretzing learns that airline employees with valid identification are allowed to bypass security at LAX. What they had set up is a, a bypass for crew members and airport employees, actually anybody that had the proper badge. You would show your badge and they would allow you to bypass both the metal detector and the x-ray unit. It was a, it was a big uh, loophole. Bretzing knows the killer was a man, and from Flight 1771's passenger manifest, 
he can see that there were four male passengers who worked for either Pacific Southwest or its parent airline, U.S. Air. It's one of these guys. We suppose that he did, in fact, bypass security carrying the weapon. Investigators need to prove conclusively who smuggled the gun on board. At the FBI laboratory, forensic specialists analyze the piece of skin found in the trigger guard. A technician is able to get a fingerprint from the skin fragment. In search of a match, he compares the print to those on file for the four male passengers who could have bypassed security. And he finds a match. There was enough of the forefinger that they were able to peel open and then match it. Just days after the crash that claimed 43 lives, the FBI has positively identified their killer. That was a key element in the investigation. His name is David Burke. David Burke cleaned uh, the airline. He was one of those employees who would go in after he landed and, and help clean up the inside. Investigators now know David Burke smuggled a gun on board Flight 1771. What they now need to explain is why. A motive gives you understanding. Uh, it helps to develop the full mosaic of the crime. Uh, knowing the motive, you're able to uh, conclusively determine what happened. Day three at the crash site. Still sifting through the stream remains of the plane, investigators uncover a bizarre but telling piece of evidence, one that points directly to the motive behind David Burke's crime. During the search, one of our people found an air sickness bag and knew immediately that it was a pertinent piece to the puzzle. Because he pushed the plane into such a steep dive, Burke unwittingly ensured that the vital clue could be discovered. The uh, air sickness bag had a, a very ominous message pinned on it. Burke had written the unsigned note during the flight. He expressed a grudge against a man called Ray. Hi, Ray. I think it's sort of ironical that we end up like this. I asked for some leniency for my family, remember? Well, I got none, and you'll get none. That was the message that we recovered from that air sickness bag. The air sickness bag is the conclusive clue they've been searching for. The clue that establishes David Burke's motive. The Ray in the note is identified as airline station manager, Ray Thompson. He worked for PSA's parent company, US Air. He was also David Burke's former boss. Uh, Ray Thompson was the supervisor. By now, Bretzing has also learned that Burke had a troubled history, both with the company and with the law. Burke had worked for U.S. Air for 14 years, most of them at the airport in Rochester, New York. Uh, there was allegations of, of criminal activity when he was back in Rochester. Burke was someone they had watched carefully for narcotic trafficking and larceny. Allegations that Burke smuggled cocaine on commercial flights were never proven. Well, basically, he just apparently stayed one step ahead of us. But, but the bottom line is that he wasn't charged. He moved uh, to the West Coast, presumably to kind of get away from the heat, if you would. But three weeks before the crash, Burke ran into more trouble. He was fired from the company after being caught on tape helping himself to the in-flight bar proceeds. He had stolen some money from the fund that the flight attendants used when they're um, making change, and he had stolen what amounted to $69. And this was the straw that broke the camel's back. Three weeks after being fired, Burke was given an opportunity to appeal. Mr. Burke had been terminated several weeks prior to the flight. Thanks for coming in, David. He then came back for an appeal hearing on the day of the flight. I reviewed your file. He was terminated by Ray Thompson. Your appeal has been denied. Under intense financial pressure, 
Burke was near the end of his rope. Why you gotta be such a jerk? That termination interview was was not a, a placid one. My decision's final, Mr. Burke. Thank you very much. As he left Thompson's office, Burke made a remark that hinted at plans for revenge. The secretary had said, uh, David, I hope you have a nice day. And David Burke, the suspect, paused at the door, turned to her and said, well, I plan to have a very nice day. When he was fired, he still had his credentials. Gotta remember, this was 1987. Security is a lot different than it is now. Right there. Investigators now know that in the days leading up to the crash, David Burke went from a grieved ex-employee to a man coldly planning murder. Now they need to find out all they can about his movements on the day of the crash. What can you tell me about David Burke? After being fired from Pacific Southwest Airlines, David Burke went to his locker, possibly to get the gun. But he went to his locker the day of that flight, prior to the flight. Whether he retrieved his gun from the locker or not, we are not, not sure. Instead of returning to the office, Burke decided to buy a ticket for flight 1771, a flight he knew Ray Thompson would be on. Ray Thompson lived in San Francisco, and he flew regularly on that flight to return to San Francisco at the end of the day. It was common knowledge among the employees that, that Ray Thompson would be on that, on, on that flight. Why Burke opted to kill so many others, along with his former boss, is a question that defies rational explanation. The average person certainly would not act with the rage and the vengeance that had to consume David Burke prior to this act. One can only imagine that there must have been something else wrong with David Burke. He just decided to take it out as an act of revenge against the company. And I don't know that there's any other motivation we can come up with. It's clear Burke's attack on Flight 1771 was meticulously planned. But exactly how events unfolded once his rampage began is still uncertain. NTSB investigators have provided a big piece of the puzzle. They've been able to match up the bullet punctured seat fragment with an exact onboard location. Row 4, seat C. Records show that on flight 1771, that seat was unoccupied but the seat directly in front of that empty seat was occupied by Ray Thompson. The finding points to the sheer power of Burke's 44 caliber handgun. His first two shots pierced not one, but two airline seats. The bullet hole would have been uh, made as the bullet passed through Ray Thompson and then uh, entered that seat and left the bullet hole there. They now know that Burke shot at least four people during his rage-filled assault on Flight 1771. Ray Thompson and three crew members. That accounts for five shots. But investigators heard six shots on the tape. They must account for them all. The gunshot sounds were picked up by a microphone in the cockpit. comparing the sound pattern of each shot, investigators can determine if they were fired in the cockpit or the passenger cabin. The shots that were fired in the, uh, in the plane, not, not in the cockpit, but in the plane, were, were distinct but muffled. Other shots were louder and clearer, indicating they were fired closer to the CBR microphone. The shots that were fired in the cockpit were very loud. We had three shots that were fired outside the cockpit and three shots that were fired inside the cockpit. Investigators don't know who was shot with the final bullet, just that it was fired in the cabin. It's enough for them to finally piece together a picture of the horrific final moments on board PSA 1771. Imagine what Ray Thompson must have thought as this person 
whom he had just terminated a few hours before, walks past him in the airline, hands him this note, and then probably goes into the ninja. And he's reading this note with its ominous message. Next, they hear the sound of the laboratory door opening. So we're, gonna, we're assuming that he handed Ray the note, went into the restroom, where he took out the gun, came back out, we heard the door close again, just before the shots. Ray! Ray Thompson probably has the most merciful of all the devs on that plane. In less than a minute, a routine fight has become a nightmare. It's a problem, Captain. It's a problem. He was very careful. He had done the planning thus far fairly well, and uh, we believe he, he followed through with that plan. I'm a problem. It wouldn't take much knowledge or experience on a, on a passenger part to know that they were in deep, deep trouble. shooting his former boss and three crew members. David Burke pushed flight 1771 into a dive and left the cockpit. The airline's chief pilot was now the only person on board who could pull the plane out of the dive. An off-duty pilot may have been moving himself forward to try to render whatever assistance he could once he realized something drastic was happening. What the hell are you doing? You gotta let me in there. Don't do this. Come on. But Burke had one bullet left. What the hell are you doing? That may have accounted for the sixth shot. There are some who speculate that David Burke was taking his own life. The evidence suggests otherwise. Had David Burke been taking his own life, the gun would have fallen from his hand after he had shot himself. But since a fragment of Burke's fingertip was recovered from the trigger guard, Bretzing reasons that the killer was alive, holding on to the gun until the very moment of impact. were sounding in the cockpit. There was uh, increased uh, noise of the plane plummeting. Then just before impact, it became silent. They tell us that it actually broke the sound barrier. Of course, it would have been a horrifying experience, the final few seconds of their life. One man's rage meant two minutes of pure terror for 42 people. I believes one man was responsible for the crash of PSA Flight 1771 in the hills of San Luis Obispo County, in which all 43 on board were killed. With all of the evidence that we have uh, recovered here, that we would have more than sufficient to charge David Burke with the violation of the air piracy statute. The unprecedented crime is solved, but aviation authorities are left with a troubling question. Could it happen again? The tragedy of Flight 1771 provoked action from the Federal Aviation Administration. The body that regulates the airline industry took urgent measures to tighten security. The FAA came out and, and uh, canceled the bypass authority, so therefore air crews and employees would have to go through the normal screening as any passenger would. Now it's, uh, it's required that uh, any employee that leaves an airline, whether they've been fired or quit or retired or whatever, must turn their credentials in immediately. Getting on an aircraft with a gun now, I won't say that it's impossible, but it's, uh, it's next to impossible. But the new measures would not prevent the world's deadliest hijacking incident. The 9-11 attacks would usher in sweeping new airline security procedures. After 9-11, several security gaps were certainly pugged. There are now federal air marshals on board many domestic U.S. flights. These are armed officers that are on flights in plain clothes. Cockpit doors have been reinforced with Kevlar, and they stay locked throughout all flights. The doors are built so that they're very hard to get through. They're ballistically sound. If David Burke was on a plane today, when he got to the cockpit, he couldn't have gotten in with the weapon he had, so he would have been able to still uh, injure or kill people in the back, but he could not have brought the plane down. 
Finally, many domestic airline pilots are now allowed to carry firearms. All of these measures have made flying safer, but nothing can completely eliminate the risk of another David Burke. Well, in my view, aviation security has been heightened tremendously. But we still have a ways to go, and aviation will always be a target.